and gentlemen, welcome back. We've got another mock draft video, and this time we've got a special guest, Mr. Mark Jarvis. You've probably seen him on Twitter. Um, but Mark, say hello to the folks. How you guys doing? And uh, if, you, if you could, real quick, just let them know where to find you, because I always say the name of your uh, website wrong. Uh, everyone does. Everyone calls it What's on Draft NFL. It's What's on, excuse me, What's on, <laughs> okay, now I'm messing myself up there. Um, what's on Draft NFL. You can find me on Twitter at What's on Draft NFL. You can also find my work on my website, What's on Draft NFL.com. There you go. Yeah, and definitely check that out because that's that's my new go to for all the stuff. NFLBigboard.com is my site, as you guys know. All of my um, um, scouting reports I'm moving from the Draft Network over to the work that Mark is doing because I love the way he does his breakdown. So head over to his website, check out all his scouting reports. But I'm glad we got him on board. We're going to have a little bit more in-depth on some of these prospects. Uh, a couple notes before we get started. This is going to be a one-round mock draft. This is going to be a little different because the guys in the Facebook group did this mock, so you're going to get some live reactions. Please don't yell at me this time. Take out your anger on the guys in the group because I didn't do it. Um, but if you want to get involved in these mock drafts, please get in the Facebook group. You can find that in the comment section. Second thing. A lot of the picks and reactions that I do, I look at the comment section, so be sure to type in the name of your team and then your comment so I can find it. Third thing about this draft, before we get started, um, there were a couple wonky trades in here. Some of them were a little goofy, so I'm not going to be able to be super specific because they were a little kind of weird, so it's just going to be what it is, and we'll work through it, and then we'll talk about... Uh, in the group, maybe changing up the rules a little bit on this. But just bear with us, and um, we're going to get through this and, and uh, figure some stuff out. So first off, on the board, we've got the Arizona Cardinals. And uh, I guess just to get us started off here, Mark, um, what are your thoughts as far as, like, guys that are worthy of a number one overall? Well, I think two guys stand out immediately, and um, that's really the only two guys that stand out. It's, it's Quinnen Williams from Alabama, the defensive lineman, um, and then Nick Bosa from Ohio State. Of course, Bosa dealing with the core injury, missing the majority of his junior season. Um, there are some questions. Would he be back for the playoffs? Decided to go ahead and uh, forego the rest of his season, declare early, and just get a jump start on being healthy for the combine. Um, with Bosa, I mean, you've got just the complete package, everything you want in, in an edge guy. Maybe not an elite athlete, but a very good one. Um, and then with Quentin Williams, you just have an absolute beast. I mean, he tears up um, interior lines like it's nothing. Um, great hand usage, just one of the most dominant players in college football over the past few years on the defense side of the football. So right out of the gate, we do already have a trade. This is one of the wonky trades, so I just want you to bear with me for a little bit. But essentially, we had a double trade. And at the end of the day, the Miami Dolphins are going to move up to the number one overall spot. So right out of the gate, let me ask you, if you saw this on draft day, the Miami Dolphins move up to pick number one. What is your instant reaction to what's going on here? Nick Bosa. Cameron Wake is getting a little bit older. They need to find some edge rush. Uh, Charles Harris didn't work out that well so far. So I'm thinking Nick Bosa is the guy here. But just looking over their roster and looking, they don't really have that much on the defensive interior either from what I'm seeing. So um, really, either one of those guys makes so much sense. And, and it's a bold move by the Dolphins, especially with a potential needed quarterback. But Is there any idea in your mind that maybe they moved up to get a quarterback would that even cross your mind just because of the fact they're going all the way up to one yes you gotta you gotta consider it um that's a lot of draft capital to give up to go get someone like Bosa or Williams even though they're you know blue chip players that's a lot to give up um but yeah I would say if they're moving up all the way to one you gotta think maybe they're going after Haskins maybe they're going after Kyler Murray well with that with the first overall pick in the 2019 NFL draft GM David and the Miami Dolphins select Nick Bosa, edge rusher, Ohio State. So like you said, he is the guy to go get. I think uh, the first thing on my mind would have been quarterback, but you're right. There's, there's nobody else that's really worth it. Um, you've already kind of given your overview of what you thought about Nick Bosa. But um, do you I mean, do you have any concerns about him, any red flags, or you think he's just going to step in and be a top guy right out of the gate? I think he just comes in day one and starts and probably stars immediately, too. I mean, we, again, I mentioned with his game, just a complete package. Um, you know, he's not the bendiest guy around the edge, but he can soften that corner and get around. And then with his hand usage, I mean, his 
his uh, list of counters is insane. I mean, he can really do it, do it all in that regard. Um, you don't know how to prepare uh, to defend against him just because he's so unpredictable with his hand usage. Um, I mean, it, again, it's a lot to give up going up to number one just to get Nick Bosa. But if you really believe that you build your team around good pass rush, it makes sense to go up to number one to get him. So now with the second pick, we got the 49ers here. And, and to be honest, if I would have seen the Dolphins move up, I would have been really excited because I'm thinking as a 49ers fan, good, they're getting a quarterback. Now we can get Nick Bosa. The problem is with the 49ers, well, obviously now they can't get Nick Bosa. Quinnen is the other guy, but I've talked to a lot of 49ers fans, especially in the comments section, they don't want a defensive tackle. In your mind, do you say, I don't care we're taking Quinnen, or is there something else on your mind right here with the 49ers? You know, honestly, if I'm the 49ers in this situation, I'm wanting to trade out more than anything just because Quinnen, I mean, talent-wise, he's probably the – I mean, he's the best thing on the board right there. I know a lot of people think Josh Allen, um, the edge guy from Kentucky, makes a lot of sense there. He fits more of a positional need. But the potential to move back and have someone else come up for a quarterback, I think it's it's too much. If you don't if you don't believe in Quinnen as the top guy on your board and worth this investment, um, you got to move out. Yeah, I would definitely agree. However, there is no trade, so I'm going to put you on the spot. I need a name. Who's it going to be? I'm going to say Josh Allen from Kentucky. I think they go for the edge rusher. Makes sense. With the second overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Justin Sullivan, GM for the 49ers, selects Devin White, linebacker, LSU. And I, nobody can see your face, but it looks like somebody just stomped on your kneecap. Give me your give me your instant well, reaction. I'm not I'm not mad because it's I mean they they lost Ruben Foster because of all the off field concerns and, and letting him go and looking at their linebacker group I mean Fred Warner um, he did a decent job last year working as the middle linebacker Malcolm Smith not not a star or anything but I mean he's he's a replacement level starter I just think that if you're going to invest that much in Devin White you have to truly believe in him as Again, a blue chip type of prospect like Quentin Williams. Um, I don't know if I'm there with White. I think he's probably a top 10 guy in this class. Great athlete. Instincts are a little bit questionable at times, but I'm not, I'm not mad at the pick. I'm just really surprised that Devin White was the pick here because um, from all I've seen from the 49er fans, it, it doesn't seem like the linebacker group is as much of an issue as the edge rush or just you know what it would be worth to move back here and have someone else come up. Would you say he's kind of a safe pick? Like he's probably not going to be a miss at linebacker? Um, I don't know if you would get everything you're hoping to out of the number two overall pick. I mean, right. that's a high-value pick. But I think he would still turn into a very solid starter in the league. All right, next up we got the New York Jets uh, sitting here at number three. Um, right out of the gate for the Jets, you're probably looking at wanting to get some offense to help your quarterback. Um, do you think there's any offensive players worth number three, or what would you want to do if you were the Jets in this spot? That's a really tough one because you do need someone to help out Darnold, to help fill out that offense. Looking at their offensive line, uh, not not a good group of guys at all, but I don't know if there's any offensive linemen that I would feel comfortable taking this early. I know some people are really high on Jawan Taylor from Florida, Jonah Williams from Alabama, um, both at tackle. I'm not sure if I'd be willing to take them at number three. DK Metcalf makes sense if uh, you're willing to sit here and, and pick it number three just because he's really just a, a next-level type of athlete, assuming his health checks out. But um, I feel like moving out might be worth it just to try and accumulate capital because there's no one that really fits, this, like, fits what you're looking for offensively um, that's worth that top-five pick. So, I would say move out. Well, that's exactly what's going to happen because we got the Denver Broncos moving up with the New York Jets. Uh, they're going to trade into this spot. So at three now, we got the Denver Broncos. What's the first thing that pops into your head here? Quarterback. I know um, there's huge connections between um, John Elway and uh, Drew Locke. I, I've heard he really loves Drew Locke and, and wants him to be the guy. I don't know if this is going to be the pick here just because you have guys like Haskins still on the board. But I think it's got to be a quarterback. With the third overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Christopher Davey, GM for the Denver Broncos, moves all the way up to three and selects Kyler Murray, quarterback, 
Oklahoma, and it's a similar looking face. That looks familiar. <laughs> Tell me about Kyler Murray and your thoughts on him going to the Broncos here. I think he's the best quarterback in the class. Um, having done all of my quarterback evaluations and feeling pretty confident with this group, I'd say you're not getting any other quarterback that is as dynamic as Kyler. Uh, you're not getting anyone that throws, you know, from different platforms and, and adjusts his arm angles. I mean, it really looks like he's playing playing baseball out there with the way he throws the ball, and, and he throws a very accurate football. The question is, he's got one fatal flaw. It's his height. And if he can't overcome that, um, it's going to completely tank his career. Because it, it 5'9"-ish, I mean, I've seen him listed 5'10". He's probably really closer to 5'9". Um, that's the one thing is he can't climb up in the pocket. You have to scheme around him and make it so he doesn't have to see over his line. And he gets a little bit of space, you know, can process things a little bit more, maybe get him rolling out. And then I know some people are worried about his body holding up. Um, I don't think that's much of an issue because I think he protects himself very well. But it's it's a risky pick. It's a very risky pick. But it's one that I would feel comfortable making as a franchise as long as you believe in Kyler as a person. Makes sense. So at number four now as we move on, Oakland Raiders are sitting on the board. They need a lot of stuff. And uh, usually in those kinds of situations you'd say, well, maybe you trade back, get a few more picks. But they've got three first-round picks so maybe they don't need to. So if we're going to sit here, what's the first thing you're thinking about in terms of need? And then maybe looking at your board, obviously Quinnen's sitting at the top, but maybe what are some, some of the names that you're looking at here for the Raiders at four? You know, Quinnen makes sense to an extent because he is that top talent on the board right now. But just looking over over the roster, their receiving group is not that pretty. I mean, Marcel Aitman is listed as <laughs> – the, the starter um, in, along uh, with Jordan Nelson, and you need someone that you can actually throw the ball to with Derek Carr if you're going to end up keeping Derek Carr. I know some people think they're going to move on from him, but I, I think they give him one more year. I'm going to say wide receiver. I'm, I'm going to say DK Metcalf. Um, I mentioned him earlier talking about the Jets, but just athletic upside and wide receiver one ability, that's probably where I would go at number four. With the fourth overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Ryan, Alex, and the Raiders select Josh Allen, edge rusher, Kentucky. So they're going with the edge, which is a need, just like pretty much every other position. What do you think about Josh Allen? Because I remember when he was sitting at about 15 to 20, I remember watching him thinking, this guy's a stud, I love him. All of a sudden, he's we're talking top five, top three, and I'm, I'm kind of a little nervous about it. What do you think about Josh Allen overall? Well, it's his growth going through into his senior year. I mean, looking at his junior year, a lot of people thought he was going to declare, ended up deciding to go back, and had a phenomenal year at Kentucky. I believe he um, had like 13, 14 sacks, something like that. Very productive year, and then really improved his ability as a pure edge rusher because last year he had a lot more off-ball responsibilities, worked a lot more on coverage. This year they kind of just um, – let him get after it, let him just chase down the quarterback, and that really helped him develop, develop as a pass rusher. So um, I don't know if I would say he's he's necessarily in the same category as Quinnen as a blue chip guy. I know he's been talked about that um, as a you know top five lock. I don't know if I would go as far as to say he's worth that, but um, he's certainly one of the more talented guys in the class and, and a first like an early first round value. And and from what I've heard too, very versatile as well. He can he can as a pass rusher also in coverage and everything else. So I feel like they, they got a pretty good player out of him. I'm assuming you think he's going to step in day one, be a, a contributor, right? Yeah, and I'm curious how they set him up with that scheme because they just invested a third-round pick in Arden Key last year. Yeah. At Frosty Rucker listed as the other starter, but I, I think you're putting uh, Key on the one side and Allen on the other and just letting him get after the quarterback. But I'm curious who he's going to have as his competition. Um, he should be an immediate starter, though. So at five now, we got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers that are sitting here, another team that has a relatively decent amount of needs. You could probably go a lot of different uh, directions. Um, what, what are your first thoughts coming into this? Just looking over the roster right now, um, you know, I know that Bruce Arians said he's comfortable with Jameis. I, I don't know if you can really trust that. <laughs> I don't know if Jameis is the guy. You've got to consider quarterback here. Um, looking over their defense – They've been needing guys in the secondary for a while. I think it's it's at least at safety they need to get someone upgrade over Chris Conte. Um, but yeah, safety stands out to me, and then quarterback as well. But uh, the rest of the defense, the rest of the team overall, I don't think it's a bad roster at all. Running back, I think some people were 
interested in. I know Josh Jacobs was mocked there by Daniel Jeremiah um, a couple of weeks ago, but you just invested, uh, I believe it was a second rounder in Ronald Jones last year. You can't go and invest first round in the running back position again. I'm going to say quarterback or safety. So I'm going to throw a curveball at you here because I looked at the comments section and by far the, the two biggest needs that everybody seemed, not that there's a ton of comments, but offensive line and cornerback. Is there anybody for you that you're looking at saying this would be a good corner or a good offensive lineman at this particular pick? Uh, offensive lineman, I guess you could go after Jonah Williams if you if you really want to make a move for a lineman here. On the interior, I don't know if you – you have anyone that would really fit. Um, and then a corner, Greedy and Byron Murphy. Greedy Williams and Byron Murphy make, make sense, but I think it's a little bit rich for them. Um, but kind of why I would say I don't think they're going corner. Um, obviously, Vernon Hargreaves has not lived up to expectations, but he was a former first-round pick. And then they just spent, um, a, a, I believe it was a second runner on MJ Stewart last year so they've invested a lot in the cornerback position uh over the years and i feel like that's something that would kind of push them away from going after byron murphy or greedy williams here well with the fifth overall pick in the 2019 nfl draft grayson gm for the buccaneers selects jonah williams offensive tackle alabama so i guess right out of the gate and on top of your your overall thoughts on jonah williams and how he performed at alabama there's a lot of talk that he can't play tackle and should be kicked into guard i know 90 percent of tackles everybody says should probably play guard for some reason but what are your thoughts can he be a tackle can he be right left or should he be playing guard i think he can be a tackle i don't i don't have any issue with saying that he can be a tackle but i think he might be better at guard just looking at his skill set um he's a little bit unrefined with his hand usage um sometimes he mistimes his punch getting into the chest of defenders uh, allows him to take control and I really like him, you know, showing off his athletic ability, getting on the move as a pulling guard um, or as a pulling lineman, rather. And I feel like if you allow him to just, let's say, go in at left guard and um, build his game up that way and use his athletic ability, that's where you're going to find most success with him. Because he's he's not a mauler in the run game, but I think he's a lot more prepared to uh, not necessarily dominate, but just perform well at the next level in the run game first, um, which is going to be easier at guarded than tackle. So the next team up, we got the Giants, and in my last mock, I had them taking Haskins here at six, and I got absolutely destroyed. Giants fans absolutely hated it. Uh, they thought Haskins was way too rich for number six overall. Is there a quarterback that you would like here at six, or are we not there yet for you? You know, Haskins, I would have to agree with them that number six is too rich for Haskins. I'm not the biggest Haskins fan. I think he can be a starter, but I'm not willing to take him at number six um, and feel comfortable with it. I would say if you're taking a quarterback at six and Kyler's off the board, I would probably go with Daniel Jones. I think he's worth that. Uh, you really need to make sure that you have a perfect structure around him. I know um, Eli has been beaten up because that line is not held up. So if you're the Giants here, take Daniel Jones and then start adding some adding some bodies to the line. Um, you know, get some really talented interior linemen. Maybe pick up someone like Chris Lindstrom later on in the draft, but. You've got to really protect Daniel Jones if, if you go after him, but I think he would be a great successor for Eli. Well, with the sixth overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, A.J., GM for the Giants, selects Dwayne Haskins, quarterback, Ohio State. So, obviously, he was thinking a lot. And, and, and to be completely fair, for people like me and for people like A.J., a lot of people are saying, first of all, quarterbacks should be, there's like four guys now that are first-round guys based on hype. And then on top of that, Giants, it's quarterback, 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 and a lot of people are saying Haskins. So um, I know you already touched on it, but um, in general, give us your overall opinion of Haskins, how he is as a player, and then maybe where, if you were a GM and needed a quarterback, where would you be a little bit more comfortable taking a guy like Haskins? Well, contrary to what Stephen A. says, he's more of a passer <laughs> than a runner. What? <laughs> Looking at Haskins' game, I don't think he's as polished as everyone wants him to be. I mean, his pocket movement is gorgeous. Um, very easy mover in there and just kind of sidesteps traffic. His mechanics are very broken in the short game, though. Um, there's a disconnect between his upper body and his lower body that really concerns me. Deep ball accuracy really isn't there on a consistent basis. I mean, he makes some really nice throws downfield, but doesn't have the touch, doesn't have the refinement with his passing that someone like Kyler does. Um, but overall, I think it's it's a... I don't want to call it a risky pick because I don't think Haskins has like high bust potential necessarily. I think he has a very solid floor, but 
I don't know if I can trust him to step in day one. You might have to have him sit for a year. And if you're going to have a guy sit for a year, why are you taking him that early? Um, yeah, I would say I'd be more comfortable towards the middle, maybe the late first round area when I when I'd want to go after someone like Haskins. With the Jaguars, the next team up on the uh, the board here. Don't get a lot of comments from Jaguars fans, so uh, I guess I don't care about them since they don't care about my videos. So hopefully they get they <laughs> get pick pick trash here. <laughs> Uh, but no, in general, I'm uh, not a huge fan of their offensive line. But with Jonah Williams gone, is there anybody kind of still top tenish in your mind for offensive line, or are we kind of just going to wait a little bit on that before we start jumping in there? I would say maybe Jawan Taylor makes sense there. Um, maybe getting upgraded over uh, over Parnell at right tackle. But you've got Cam Robinson, and, and do you really want to invest a, a high pick like that in a in a right tackle? Um, yeah, I think I think you might be better served waiting for another round or two, considering the depth of this class at tackle. Yeah, and then um, I'm guessing you have a name because you mentioned it a little bit earlier. But the other thing that really jumps out at me when I look at the Jaguars is wide receiver. Um, I'm just curious. I, I know you've got at least one you're comfortable with, but uh, are there some wide receivers that you think maybe should be a good value for the Jaguars here? I already mentioned Metcalf, and, and outside of Metcalf, I don't know if there was anyone that would be really worth this early pick. Um, you know, Kelvin Harmon, Marquise Brown have been talked up as maybe first rounders, but those are more late first. The only guy I've seen consistently talked about as an early first is Matt Calf. So I um, mean they're just looking at their wide receiver group. I don't think it's um I don't think it's a terrible group. They definitely need some improvements, but uh, Keelan Cole has done well in at times. DJ Chark they just invested heavily in. Dante Moncrief isn't too bad. DD Westbrook, um, not a great receiver, but acceptable. I think Looking over this Jaguars roster, there's so much talent on it that it's tough to nail down one spot of where they should go. Well, it's funny you should mention that because we just got word that there's going to be a trade. The uh, Carolina Panthers are going to be moving up to the seventh overall pick. The details are a little bit messy, like I said, with the trades, but essentially what we're talking about here is a first and a second round to be able to move up to this spot. It's an additional first and second uh, to get this spot, but what do you think the Panthers could be looking to move up to get here? Oh, they got to be going after an offensive lineman. I don't see too many other ways that they could go. Very solid defense overall. Um, at the skill positions, they have a lot invested. I mean, they already um, put a first rounder to McCaffrey. DJ Moore was a first, but that offensive line has really been—I wouldn't say downright horrendous, but it's been pretty close to it. Um, haven't been able to pre- protect Cam Newton well. I don't know if I would be willing to go, you know, for like a Lindstrom or something like that this early, but I guess Cody Ford, um, having the versatility to play inside and outside, Cody Ford would make a lot of sense. If you're really high on Dalton Risner from Kansas State, he makes sense here as well. well. With the seventh overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Anthony and the Carolina Panthers select Cleland Furl, edge rusher, Clemson. I know there was a lot of talk in the comment section with Julius Peppers going to hang it up and uh, just age in general being kind of a problem. Some other people mentioned that, you know, the trenches is kind of the identity of the Panthers, so we want to stick with that. What are your thoughts about Cleveland at seven? I think for Cleveland, it's it's a little bit rich considering you have guys like Ja'Kai Plyatt, Brian Burns, maybe some more explosive and dynamic pass rushers available. But Cleveland's a, a pretty safe pick, I think. Um, you get a little bit of versatility with him. He could play a little bit of linebacker if you really wanted to push that. I don't know if it's it's safe to, to do that. And by linebacker, I mean you're playing him as a pass rushing linebacker still. Um, but it's it's a value pick in terms of like what you're looking for at the position. Looking at um, who they've got, Wes Horton and uh, Mario Addison listed as their starters. Not a great group of guys there, so... It makes sense to go after the position. I just don't know if I'd feel more comfortable going after someone like Brian Burns or, you know, going after Cleveland Farrell over guys like Brian Burns and Ja'Kai Plyte. As somebody who doesn't do this as much as you do, I'm glad you said that because since day one I've been trying to figure out why. And he's been dropping a little bit, but it wasn't too long ago he was number two, number three on the board, and I just did not understand it. So, anyways, uh, Cleveland Farrell to the Carolina Panthers. Next up we've got the, um, the Arizona Cardinals. This is where they had ended up. Uh, after that trade so they did get to move back a little bit Um, we had mentioned before that the Cardinals maybe would want to get a little bit of help for their offense you know again this is kind of tricky with how this all works out it should be the Lions spot 
just don't don't trust me when I say this is the Cardinal spot. But I'm I'm still thinking here with the Cardinals, and I don't know if you would agree with this, but we we should be looking for offense, right, to try to help out our our offensive line, our quarterback, those guys. Is Quinton Williams on the board here? He is. Why not Quinton Williams? I don't know. I, mean, that... I get I get the <laughs> at offensive line, but Kandichi has not lived up to expectations. Their other D tackle is Corey Peters. You can go and get a legit blue chip talent. You missed the opportunity to do it with Bosa, but now you can go up and do it with Quentin Williams. Go get him. Like I would have rushed, I would rush to the podium for this pick. Yeah, and I, I think after the first pick, you can start asking the question about what about Quentin Williams. But we do have, believe it or not, another trade. The uh, Arizona Cardinals are not going to take Quentin Williams. Uh, they're going to trade back with the Minnesota Vikings. And I don't think it's going to be a huge surprise, but um, take a guess who the Vikings are coming up to get. Um, I hope it's Quinn Williams. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Don't overthink it. With the eighth overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Cameron and the Vikings have had enough of this atrocity. They're going to select Quinnen Williams, defensive tackle, out of Alabama. So before we get to your thoughts on the fit, because I know there's some talk about how many of these defensive tackles are still going to be around, what are your thoughts about Quinnen Williams making it all the way back to eighth? Just based on positional value, and I know people value edge more than D-tackle, and you know, you, you're going to have some guys fall once you start having picks come off the board, but the fact that Quinnen made it this far is really surprising to me. Because, again, I think he's – either number one or number two. I mean, it's really 1A, 1B with him and Bosa. So the fact he made it all the way to eight is, is really surprising to me. But um, it's an incredible value pick. Yeah, and here's uh, – we did have a, uh, a comment from uh, Cameron in the Facebook group. He said, I saw Williams falling and couldn't pass the opportunity to add a dominant defensive line piece, especially with Griffin and Richardson's future uncertain. So I, mean, I think regardless of the team – any team that says enough is enough, I'm going up to eight to get this guy. I have a hard time even arguing with that. Even if you've got some decent defensive tackle pieces, the value is just un- incredible right here. Yeah, and I don't really care about the fit either or who they have there. I mean, Quentin Williams steps in, and you're getting, I wouldn't say all pro day one, but it's about as close to all pro day one as you can get. So next up, we got the Buffalo Bills at number nine on the clock. Another team we saw take getting a quarterback last year, another team that's struggling. Obviously, whenever you get a quarterback and your team isn't good, for me personally, I'm thinking we got to help this guy out. But what are your thoughts for the Bills here at nine? I would agree. Got to help. Uh, got to help Josh Allen out. Got to get him some weapons. I mean, Robert Foster went undrafted last year and was one of their top receivers. Zay Jones has not panned out so far as a former second round pick. I'm going receiver. I'm taking DK Metcalf here. I think the value lines up. Um, if the medicals check out, he's a top ten pick, and I think it's a perfect landing spot here. With the ninth overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Brian, GM for the Buffalo Bills, selects Cody Ford, Oklahoma. And the reason I didn't say his his, uh, position is because on the card that they turned in, it says offensive tackle. Do you think Cody Ford is playing tackle in the NFL? I think so. I think you're probably going to play him right tackle just because I don't know if he has good enough mobility to to protect a blind slide. Excuse me, blind side. Um, I don't know if he's the guy you want to trust over there. And they already have Deion Dawkins, who I know hasn't been great for them, but he's been a serviceable starter uh, from my understanding. I'm just not sure if you want to immediately insert him at right sack or if you want to start him off on the inside and work his way out. Yeah, either, either way, they do need some offensive line help. Do you think, I, I noticed Cody Ford is flying up the board. His name has been said quite a bit more lately. Do you think top 10 is a little bit too much, or is this getting to be about about time for him to go? Just because of how many tackles there are, I wouldn't say I'm opposed to, to any of the top guys going in the top 10. I mean, Jonah Williams, like I mentioned, Jawan Taylor, all these guys make sense uh, in, in their own, as long as it's the right fit, I guess. But, um, you know, Cody Ford, it's really interesting to watch his rise because heading into the year, we saw Drew Samia, Ben Powers, even Bobby Evans, the uh, other tackle at Oklahoma, all these Oklahoma guys getting buzz as maybe early round guys. And then just out of nowhere, Cody Ford. Didn't start last year, from my understanding, because of uh, Orlando Brown uh, being the starter, and then just comes out of nowhere and then just transforms into this dominating right tackle. Just, oh, he's certainly a top 50 pick, was what people were saying once we got into about November, and it's just been upwards from there. So it's been really cool to watch that. I, I wouldn't be shocked to see him go top 10. So next up, we got the Jets on the clock after they had traded back with the Denver Broncos. Um, the assumption being, you know, there, there wasn't a whole lot of talent for what you would assume that they'd want to get from where they were. 
So now we're back on the clock here. Um, hopefully they weren't trying to go back and get Ford because he just went off the board. I know there was a commenter, uh, 2 Gallup 2 in the last video, who said he'd like to see offensive line, defensive line, edge, or cornerback. Those are his big things. So if I had to constrain you to those things, which player would you take out of that group? Which team was it again? This is for the Jets. The Jets, okay. Yeah, yeah I think... I think offensive line, while it does make sense, I'm again, I'm not sure about the value exactly where you're getting it here. Um, and then the fact DK is still on the board, I'm going to continue to really want to push for DK Metcalf, but I think it's almost a guarantee they're going offense, no matter what. But if they can't, then maybe they'd want to... If they can't... Here, let me, let me just stop you there because I was leading at something. There's another trade. <laughs> In other words, if they can't, you know, keep moving. Anyways, the uh, the Houston Texans are actually going to move up from 23 to 10. Again, I don't have the details, but if I were to do a little bit of math myself, I would guess it's going to be in and around a 2020 first-round pick to be able to move up this much, maybe even a little bit more. Either way, the Texans are now sitting here. What are your thoughts? Why are the Texans moving all the way up to 10 from 23? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? I have no clue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, best you could go offensive line. Um, you know, yeah. Central Henderson and, and Julian Davenport as your starters. I don't know if I'd feel comfortable with that. Um, I mean, you could go on the interior and go after someone like Chris Lindstrom, but that might be a little bit rich for a guard. I have no clue what they're going after. I mean, tight end, if you really love TJ Hawkinson or Noah Fant, maybe go up and get one of those guys, but – I don't know what they're chasing here. That was going to be my question to you, too, is because I feel like the Texans arguably have the worst offensive line. Is there a guy here? But uh, apparently not. So either way, with the 10th overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Bryson Sims, the GM for the Texans, is going to select Greedy Williams, cornerback, LSU. First of all, is there any reason to move up like this to get Greedy? Greedy's stock has kind of fallen off a little bit, and it's understandable because he does run hot cold. You look at his ability to... Hold down the sideline. Um, you know, you try and have someone go vertical on him, and he's shutting it down. Um, I have questions about his ability to get to the catch point on those interbreaking routes, but um, for the most part, it's usually no fly zone with him, and, and he has some decent range as a tackler, gets the job done. I think as a top 10 pick, it's not a bad move. You know, it, near the end of it, I wouldn't be willing to invest earlier than this. It's about kind of the zone where you think Greedy. Really is worth it. Um, and I know they, they're they kind of aging on the back end. Um, Kareem Jackson getting up there, Jonathan Joseph, is is pretty old. So going after a guy that you can pair with Kevin Johnson, hopefully, is uh, your two corners of the future. I think it's it's a pretty solid move. To give Bryson the benefit of the doubt, do you think Greedy, with, with his build and ability, do you think it's possible there's a team that just absolutely falls in love with him, maybe above the other corners, that says, I don't want to wait for somebody else, i got to get Greedy? Yeah, to an extent. There, it's really just him and Byron Murphy in a category of their own right now. Um, I don't think anyone else is really pushing that group. And so if you really love Greedy and you want to get in there and get your cornerback, I think a team might be willing to make that kind of move. Yeah, and just looking at their, their team right now, I'm looking at it. Kareem Jackson and Jonathan Joseph, not super terrible. you got Kareem that's a free agent this year and Joseph next year. they got tons of cap space to be able to re-sign them, but the age might be prohibitive. Uh, even if you do want to resign them, so wanting to get some youth at a very critical position, it's it's a it's a steep price to pay, but you can definitely understand and and the the importance of it. Next up, we got the Cincinnati Bengals sitting on the clock. Uh, typically, this is a spot where we say, uh, "Hey, how about that linebacker out of LSU? That'd be pretty good, right?" But he went number two overall, so so that's not an option for us. So, what do you think for the Bengals right here? You nailed it. My first thought was like, "Okay, Devin White's not available." What are we doing now? Like, right. what's what's possible? I don't think Mac Wilson is safe enough as a pick to be worth, you know, the 11th pick. I don't think it warrants it. Devin Bush in the first round, at number 11, that's way too rich. Um, so you got to start looking elsewhere. Do you want to potentially move on from Andy Dalton and get a quarterback of the future? Haskins and, uh, and Kyler are gone, so do you like Daniel Jones? Do you like Drew Locke? I think quarterback's certainly in play here. Um, you could always look to get an upgrade on the offensive line. The Bengals have been struggling there recently. Maybe go after Jawan Taylor, get him at right tackle. Um, but yeah, those are those are the spots I'm really looking at is is quarterback and uh, and, and right tackle, which is Jawan Taylor. With the 11th overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Andrew GM for the Bengals selects Jawan Taylor, offensive tackle. 
out of Florida. So obviously you, you like the pick, but tell me a little bit about Jawan Taylor. Uh, he's another guy that's been flying up the board. I, I think the senior bowl, is that kind of where he stood out? No, it, his stock kind of rose around the time of the senior bowl, but he wasn't able to attend as an underclassman. But um, what happened was his, his tape uh, in 2017 wasn't that impressive, kind of more tools than, than a put together package. And then we've seen his stock rising as people have been getting into his tape and really evaluating him and, He's improved significantly since last year. So um, put all those tools together and has actually transformed himself into a powerful right tackle that can come in and probably start day one. So the comment from Andrew, the GM for the Bengals, said this is the best tackle in the draft. He was available, so we took him. Do you think Jawan is possibly the best tackle in this draft? It's possible. I don't know if I'd go as far as to say that. I still need to watch some more Jonah Williams, more Jawan, just to get a better feel of the class overall. I think if you're looking at a tools uh, standpoint, I think – you can argue that, but I think it's it's still too tough to say at this point. No one's really separated themselves, especially prior to the combine. Uh, the testing is going to be huge. So next up at 12, we've got uh, the green and gold, the greatest team in the history of the NFL. The Green Bay Packers are up next. So, um, you know, I, I, I can say as a Packer fan and somebody who lives on Packers Twitter, which can uh, get to hear a lot of the same stuff over and over again, edge rusher is obviously what everybody's dying for. If I had to ask you to pick one edge rusher for the Packers right now, who would it be? It didn't even, like, I didn't hesitate all in my mind. Ja'Kai Plight, he's okay. the guy. Um, you know, just an insane bend around the corner. You don't have as much versatility with him to, to drop off into coverage, but you want someone to get after the quarterback. Ja'Kai Plight's the guy. The other the other big needs uh, that, at least for me, um, safety, they don't have really hardly anybody there. Tremont Williams, they brought from corner to safety. He wasn't very good at it. He's extremely old. Um, guard, they just they just don't have anybody. If, if you had to pick somebody, either a safety or a guard, first of all, is there anybody that you're thinking at this point? And if so, who would that be? You know, Nasir Adderley from Delaware has been mostly talked about as a late first. I think... He's going to test incredibly well. I expect him to run it in the mid-low 4.3s, destroy the combine overall, and, and his tape is really impressive, the range he can cover. I think you can put him on the back end and, and have him, if not play single high, which I think you could do, you could play too deep with him um, and have him as a very, very good uh, free safety. So I would say Nasir Adderley, it's a, it's a little bit early consider, uh, compared to what most people think with him, but I think it's a, a pick that would be very solid, and I think you get a, a – not necessarily a franchise guy, but um, a cornerstone player for your defense. With the 12th overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Chris Robbins, GM for the Green Bay Packers, selects Ed Oliver, defensive tackle, Houston. So this was actually my pick in my last mock. It was mostly negative feedback that I got. You know, I heard a lot of things recently, not even so much in the comment section, but he's not really built for a 3-4 system. You don't want him to, to have to do the two-gapping stuff. He's too small for that. But what are your thoughts on Ed Oliver? I know his stock's been sliding quite a bit. There's concerns about his size. What, what do you think about him? I think he's a dynamic pass rusher, but he's all penetration. Um, that's the only way you're going to win with him. You can't have him sit there and hold it down and, you know, clog up space you've got to get him going and get him into the backfield and just looking at that and I, again I don't want to go too far away from who Ed Oliver is a player because he's a very impressive player but looking at who they have in the in the Packers uh defensive line and, and maybe I'm wrong on this you, you'd be much more apt to tell me but Mike Daniels Kenny Clark Muhammad Wilkerson I mean that's a lot of some big name guys and, and from my understanding talented players and and why why are you going after someone like Ed Oliver there yeah, that, that's that's also the general consensus. I mean, that pass rush is the biggest need, I think, is the only reason anybody would look at him. But, yeah, the, the defensive tackle is one of the only strengths on the entire defense. So, yeah, point definitely taken there. Especially in a 3-4, I'd add. In a 3-4, you have a lot more responsibility as a run defender right. if you're playing on the interior. And I don't think um, Ed Oliver can be trusted to do that. You've got to get him in a 4-3 and let him just get after it. So next up we have the Lions with our convoluted little trade system. But the Lions, we're sitting here now. They're back on the, the clock. I know a lot of people, and I've done some picks for the Lions. Um, I've taken a lot of guff from Lions fans. But edge rusher definitely seems to be the biggest need. I know you already mentioned Ja'Kai Polite. Secondary, I think, is also a, uh, a big need for the Lions. What are your thoughts at those positions for the Detroit Lions? Well, the thing with Polite is he's probably strictly an outside linebacker who's rushing the passer. I think Brian Burns, even though he only weighed like 235 in the season, I think he has the frame to support a lot more weight. I think he makes a lot of sense. I'm, he's definitely going to be 
more of a, a lighter guy. You're not getting him above maybe 260. But I think if you can get Brian Burns to a solid 250, 255 and have him playing as as a defensive end in a 4-3, I think he'd be a very good fit for the Lions, and he'd be a very productive pass rusher for them. So we actually have, I believe, the what would this be now, the second or third trade for the Detroit Lions. The Jacksonville Jaguars are actually going to move up to this spot. So the Jaguars moving up to, what are we on now, pick 13-ish? What... Um, what do you think for the Jaguars? Because they've, they've got some needs here. Obviously, there's some questions about quarterback. I think a lot of Jaguars fans in particular are fed up with Blake Bortles. Do you think there's maybe a chance we're going quarterback here, or what, what are we looking at? Moving back up, um, yeah, I think quarterback makes a lot of sense here. And Drew Locke's still on the board. Daniel Jones still on the board. I know Daniel Jones has seen his stock kind of fall in draft media, but I'm still very high on him, and I believe in him as a franchise guy. I think you can insert him day one and, and get um, – Get him in it, you know. Get the offense going around him, and actually turn the offense not necessarily into a juggernaut, but into a functioning NFL offense, uh, replacing Blake Bortles. So I would say Daniel Jones is the pick here. Um, the fact they move back up with the 13th overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Michael Lee, GM for the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars, selects Nikhil Harry, wide receiver, Arizona State. You got the scrunch face going on. Tell me your thoughts. Well, I mean, you invested in DJ Chark last year as a second rounder. You've got Dante Moncrief. I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not saying this is a, a stacked wide receiver group, but you have a much bigger need at quarterback. And I guess you could chase after, I mean, maybe Drew Locke falls to late first. You can come back up. Um, maybe you like Brett Rippon or someone like that. Will Greer in the third round, fourth round. But you've got to get a quarterback here because what's, what's Nikhil Harry going to be worth when you have a quarterback who can't throw the football and Blake Bortles? Um, and then even, even Nikhil Harry here, I, I'm a, I wouldn't say, uh, um, I wouldn't say I'm a fan of Nikhil Harry necessarily, but I think he has a very solid game. You can turn him into a wide receiver one with the right coaching um, and improving his game. But I have some questions about him in his routes. He's very slow to get into his breaks, doesn't explode. He's a contested catch guy, going to have some flashes of Laquan Treadwell, which um, I, I just don't know if he's worth that kind of pick. In, what are we, number pick number 13 now? Yeah. That's early for him. When you could get someone who like Kelvin Harmon or, or Hakeem Butler who um, is much more adept to winning above the rim. So I already know, I'm not even going to ask for your comment because I already know what you think, but I just want you to know the, the GM's comments on this pick. I'm going to condense it a little bit. His thoughts on Harry, first of all, he believes he's a top five player, and uh, he says that he believes he is a more versatile Hopkins. So there you go for top five player, and his comp is, is Hopkins. So I can don't... I add something to that real quick? Yeah. First, that's, that's kind of what makes it so fun is, is um, you know, he sees him as a top five guy. And as the Jaguars GM, he has the right to go up and do that. Um, but it's still surprising, and it's it's a move that I wouldn't expect. But if someone really falls in love with the Kill Harry's game, I can see why that would be, you know, why he would be considered a top 15 pick. I, I can understand the upside there. I, it's I disagree with the with the GM here, but I think it's a very fun pick uh, getting him that early. Yeah, that is fun. It, I, I think with the draft as well as with fantasy football, it's the same thing. That's one of the things I like. Even for somebody who doesn't do this as much as you do, I love having my guys. I know I'm wrong. I don't care. That's my guy right there. And I, same with fantasy football. I'm picking him. Well, that was dumb. Well, it's my pick, and I'm going to do what I want to do. It is fun, and then you get to see your guys, and you know, most of the time you're wrong, but every once in a while you call out somebody that was really, really awesome, and you get to brag about it for an entire year. I just, I, I, that's what I love about this stuff. That's what I love about the draft, and I love doing this. So, anyways, and 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 that's the other thing too is for however many months it's going to be, everybody's going to say Nikhil Harry was a terrible pick. But you know what happens if he ends up having a great year? Nobody can say anything anymore. So just stand by your guys. So next up we have the Atlanta Falcons. It's been kind of a crazy. A lot of stuff going on here, but for some reason I feel a little bit of calming coming out with the Falcons. They've got a decent, you know, a, a pretty decent roster. I know they had a pretty bad year, but they've got some pieces there. As far as what you think, maybe they have some needs, maybe reassessing your board, and, and what, what kind of makes sense here for the Falcons, you think? D-tackle makes a lot of sense. You need to get somebody beside Grady Jerry, and this is kind of the the top mocks that I've seen in, in people talking about, okay, who, who can we go after here and, and really fill out our defensive line? And I've seen Jeffrey Simmons mentioned a lot. I know there are some concerns about his off-field. I'm not going to get too deep into that, but I think talent-wise, I think Jeffrey Simmons would be worth that caliber of a pick. 
Uh, maybe if you love Christian Wilkins or Dexter Lawrence or something like that, here you could make that move as well. That was actually going to be my question. There were a ton of comments from Falcons fans almost unanimously saying defensive tackle needs to be the pick. Obviously, that wasn't the pick I made because everybody made sure that I knew next time it has to be a defensive tackle. So anyways, with the 14th overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Daniel Mertz, GM for the Atlanta Falcons, selects Christian Wilkins, defensive tackle, out of Clemson. So obviously a man of the people here. Daniel knew exactly what to do. What are your thoughts on Christian Wilkins? You know, his stock was really interesting to watch because he, I didn't like him that much watching his 2017 tape. Um, I thought he was a little bit overhyped and kind of everyone came around that narrative like Christian Wilkins is not a top five pick. He was being billed as that by big draft media. And really he was more like a, a solid late first, early second. And he had a really solid senior year, um, pretty much continuing on the path he was on of like an upward trajectory and um, like I said before, if someone, if, if the GM really loved Christian Wilkins, it makes sense. I'm not sure I would feel comfortable getting him this early, but just a very well-rounded player. He can kind of do it all. Um, you're not getting anything special with him like Ed Oliver, like Ed Oliver's pass rush or, or Quinn Williams, just physical dominance, but you're getting a very well, very well-rounded guy. So next up, we've got the Washington Redskins. Obviously, the first thing that comes to a lot of people's mind with the Redskins is what happened to Alex Smith and his injury. Quarterback obviously comes to mind. But as I was reading through the comments, I noticed for most people, it's Kyler Murray or bust. At least, you know, it's, it's if he's there, I'll take him. Otherwise, I don't want a quarterback. There was one guy, however, Trevor Patch in the comments section, that called out Tyree Jackson. Now, I'm guessing you don't think he's – I know. I'm just – I just want to give you the opportunity real quick to give me your thoughts – because I know you've run through the, the quarterbacks and you've done that kind of stuff. What are your thoughts on Tyree Jackson, the, the Gary Vaynerchuk guy out of Buffalo? I got a question first. Did he say Tyree Jackson first round, or did he say Tyree Jackson third, fourth round? Well, because it's he, a big difference there. He was referencing the, the first pick, and he said, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to look it up again, but it was something like you know long shot or, or whatever you call it. In other words, let's just say he meant first round. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It was just a comment. I'm just curious what you think. I mean, Tyree, you look at the physical abilities, um, 6'7", 245. He can throw it 65, 70 yards without even having to wind up much. I mean, he has an absolute cannon. And I understand why people would fall in love with the physical ability. I think his accuracy is actually very underrated. He's one of those guys who you just – if it was, you know, maybe like a foot closer, you get the ball just that much closer, and um, and it's it's on the money. But he was just a little bit too inconsistent. His processing, his processing speed was not up to par with NFL standards. I think if you give him a year or two to build up his game, he can become a starting caliber quarterback and a very good starting caliber quarterback. The question is just, do you trust him to make that leap and actually evolve his game from playing at Buffalo? I've got one more exercise before, you, before we get to the pick. I've, I've been banging the drum a lot for the Redskins to get a wide receiver, but one thing that drives me nuts is every time they get a wide receiver, it seems like they get a traits guy. They got a guy that runs a 4-3 something or a 6-6 guy or whatever the case may be. I just want a good, safe football player. Kind of like if I were to give it the Packers analogy, I don't want an Equinemius and a Marquez Valdez-Scantling. I want a Devontae Adams, right? He's not a super fast guy. He's six foot one. He's just a good football. Who's the wide receiver in your mind that's just a good, solid football player that's not going to shock anybody at the Combine? Man, to be completely honest with you, I don't know if there is one. Everyone in the first round you're looking at is probably going to be a traits guy. Okay. I mean, Kelvin Harmon's a traits guy. Hakeem Butler, a traits guy. Mark, uh, Marquez Brown, Marquise Brown, rather, a uh, traits guy. DK, I already mentioned a bunch. He's a traits guy. I don't know if there's anyone that you can say, okay, he's just a very refined player. I mean, I guess some people are going to argue A.J. Brown. I don't know if I feel comfortable taking him that early. Uh, Debo Samuel makes sense. Um, but he's more of a late first-round, early second-round type of talent. With the 15th overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Peter Gordon for the Redskins selects Ja'Kai Polite, edge rusher out of Florida. So we've talked a little bit about him, so tell me a little bit more in depth what you think about Ja'Kai Polite here. He's another one of these like late risers, kind of like Cody Ford, where he had almost no buzz going into the season, and then just out of nowhere, one clip got posted of him bending the corner and just exploding, and everyone lost their minds. Like, oh, Ja'Kai Polite is the truth. He's a top-10 pick. And when you look at what he can do just as a pure pass rusher, it makes sense. He's a little bit more, um, I guess, athleticism than refinement right now. Hand usage needs a little bit of, wor- a little bit of work, but um, just looking at the traits, very impressive guy. I just don't know if it's, it's the right move here because – 
Alex Smith is not playing in 2019. You need a quarterback because Colt McCoy is not the guy. Um, sure, you could try and, and play it safe and you know go la- go later on with a guy like Brett Rippon or Will Greer, but you've got to go and get a quarterback and get someone that can run this offense. So, um, and then you look at the depth that they have on, on their defense. You got Preston Smith and, and Ryan Kerrigan are already starters at outside linebacker, if I'm not mistaken. So, where does Jakai Plight full, uh, fit in here? Where does he you know make his home for the Redskins. I, I just think it's trying to um, it's trying to add too much to a position that's already filled, and uh, you have much more present needs. Next up, we got the Detroit Lions once again, and I'm going to ruin the supl- surprise here. There is no trade. They are actually going to make a pick. <laughs> we mentioned edge. We mentioned uh, defensive back. If there's any other needs or any of those, what, what do you think, looking at who you have left on your board? Who makes sense for the Lions right here? Just looking through, I don't think offense has anything that stands out. But, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, I mentioned uh, DN makes some sense if you like Brian Burns and think his frame can hold up. Quarterback Byron Murphy, um, you might be able to go after him um, and get him as a day one starter. I think he has the versatility. You can play him outside or in the in the slot as a, as a nickel corner. Um, just a very well-rounded cornerback. So I think those are the two top options for me is Byron Murphy and, and Brian Burns. With the 16th overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Jai V, GM for the Lions, selects Nazir Adderley, safety, Delaware. So I was a little surprised when I went through and saw this, but you mentioned him as, as maybe being somebody that's a, a good enough value to be at least a mid-first. What do you think about the pick here? Well, looking at the guys they've got, Glover Quinn um, and then Quandre Diggs, I, I know some people are a fan of Diggs, but from what I've heard, you know, not, not a guy who's – someone that you're going to say, okay, we can't draft a, a replacement. Um, Nasir Adderley, it's it's kind of a toss-up at safety for most people between him and Deontay Thompson, but Thompson had a really rough stretch late in, in the season in the college football playoff, had some key mistakes, and just wasn't covering ground the same way he was early on in the year. Um, I think Adderley, you have a little bit more upside physically. Um, the ball skills are there. He has the versatility to play corner if you want him to. You can kind of just put him wherever you want him to and, and let him go and get after it um, on the back end if you're trying to play him as a ball hawk or, or just uh, in, in coverage as, as a man corner guy. So really whatever you want to do with uh, with Mr. Adderley, he's a ball of clay. Next up we got the Cleveland Browns. Now they've had a ton of draft picks over the last several years. What have you been thinking about their ability to draft these last couple of years with all these picks? Well, I think obviously it's been nice for them to have all of that draft capital. Um, haven't necessarily – Put it to good use up until this most recent draft where they got uh, Baker, Nick Chubb, and um, you know some of the guys that got in this past class, Denzel Ward. But um, you know having that draft capital has certainly given them a lot of not necessarily you know key guys, but good role players. Um, you know some some I wouldn't say replacement level guys, just guys that are you know mid level, maybe slightly above average stars. David Njoku, uh, Joel Batoni is a little bit further back, but I think he was a good pick as well. But um, you know, they've got a, I guess, a disparity, in my opinion, between the top guys and the guys that are those players that you're going to be trying to look to upgrade from. Because you've got guys like Baker Mayfield, Nick Chubb, like I mentioned, Miles Garrett, top guys. And then you've got some real, like, weird ones like uh, Trevon Coley, just uh, guys that really don't make much sense. Is like, why are they starting? Travis Carey, why is he in there? So you've got some big holes you've got to fill. So there's another trade coming up. The Oakland Raiders are going to be moving up, and they're actually giving up both of their first-round picks, but they're getting back a Cleveland Browns 2020 first as well as a 2019 third. If my math isn't off, the Browns got absolutely robbed here. But again, not going to focus too much on that. Bottom line is the Raiders are moving up. So what in your mind makes sense for the Oakland Raiders as they move up here? Obviously they have a lot of needs. They've already picked Ed Rusher early on. Who who on your board kind of makes sense for the Raiders right now? DK is still on the board. Go get DK Metcalf a receiver. I feel like they could go elsewhere. You know, we saw Nikhil Harrier come off. Um, so if the GM really loves Calvin Harmon or Hakeem Butler, maybe even Marquise Brown, maybe go a different direction there. Maybe they fall in love with Drew Locke or Daniel Jones. But I think you go get DK Metcalf and get a stud. With the 17th overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Ryan and the Raiders select byron murphy cornerback washington so i haven't heard you mention byron murphy i know you you 
kind of talked about the other two corners. It's definitely pretty contentious. Some people, you know, it doesn't matter what corner I pick. There's always a comment saying either it should have been Byron or it should have been Greedy or it should have been whoever. What is it about Byron Murphy that maybe kind of doesn't put him in the same category as the other two? Well, Byron is not necessarily the the same type of measurables guy. Um, He's not as long as Greedy, for instance. But I think he is a very underrated athlete, I guess is how I would put it. I mean, he can hold up against anyone in man coverage, in my opinion, from what I've seen so far. So um, I think it's just the fact that he doesn't have the same physical tools necessarily that some of these other guys have. It gets him overlooked. So here's a comment that uh, Ryan had said, the GM for the the, uh, Raiders, as far as why he decided to do this. He said, I made the trade because it allowed me to move up and grab a corner I believe we need, and that would be gone by 24. This also gave me a pick for next year that I believe will be at a higher pick in 2020 than the 27th pick I just traded away. In my mind, I move up with both picks, grab an extra third-round pick, gives the Raiders additional ammunition next year to possibly move up on a quarterback-heavy draft if Carr continues to struggle. So there's definitely a lot of – it almost seems like, in my mind, the trade was the best part, and then the the actual pick was just kind of – kind of a bonus but uh yeah there's no question if you like byron murphy and you've got some some additional draft capital now the the uh the raiders have another first round pick next year and like you said a, a very heavy draft for uh for quarterbacks at least it's supposed to be so personally i, I kind of like it i don't know about you yeah it just it depends on how much you're willing to to guess on are you getting an early pick next year because if you truly believe you're like guaranteed to get an early pick next year it makes a lot of sense you might be able to you know package that go up and get herbert or Tua if you're a Tua fan if you love from he's probably going to be available so you've got a lot of options that are going to next year and you give Carr another year to figure it out and then hopefully turn the thing uh turn things around so next up we've got the cardinals finally on the clock obviously we've gotten quite a few picks to be able to get back here so if we're able to get a bunch of picks which we need and fix the offense. I feel like this is a really good, uh, you know, move for for my opinion. So, what what's going to make it worth it? What 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 pick for you right now makes it worth moving all the way back here? Yeah, man, it's tough because I feel like offensive line would be a good spot to go here. Um, Chris Lindstrom makes sense. I really like him, even though again, guard's not the highest value position. I really love his game. I guess Dalton Risner with the versatility. Um, no matter what you do with him, you could probably find a spot for him on that line and have him play decently well. I think there's potential to go receiver because all you really have there is Fitzgerald and Christian Kirk and Fitzgerald coming up on the end of his career. But um, I think you got to go line. you got to get someone like Chris Lindstrom and, and, and shore that up to, to give Rosen some help. And, again, it's all about just giving Rosen some help here. With the 18th overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Jordan Fox, GM for the Arizona Cardinals, selects Greg Little, offensive tackle, Ole Miss. So they did get an offensive lineman. But I haven't heard you mention his name. What are your thoughts on Greg Little? You know, Greg Little is seeing his stock fall, I wouldn't say rapidly, but it's kind of been deteriorating. Heading into the year, you talked about his potential top 10 guy. It was all tools, um, not a very refined blocker, a guy who's, you know, it's kind of like with Jawan Taylor last year, except he didn't put it together. Greg Little, I, I understand why you'd be a fan of, of his upside, but you're willing to risk Rosen's health and, and uh, you know, put out a first round pick for, for a guy like little i don't know if it's the right move so next up we've got the uh tennessee titans i've been banging the drum a little bit on edge rusher even though i know maybe defense isn't what a lot of people are focusing on for this team overall but it seems like the comment section generally agreed with that john maxwell in the comments specifically pointed out that he'd like to see more of a physical guy to compliment landry because landry obviously is, is the speed bend guy around the edge maybe we can get an edge setter you know on the other side do you think that guy exists here at 19 can I look through and see if I've got anyone that stands out? Because I really want to pull up and check because, yeah. I, I mean, Burns is not going to be that guy. Yeah, right. You know, one, one guy that we haven't talked about at all that stands out is uh, Rashawn Gary. Okay. You're not going to play him as, as an outside linebacker, but um, if you're looking for a little bit thunder, um, you know, his versatility, I guess you could do a couple things with him. I think he stands out as, as maybe just a bet on upside. Really just looking through here, there's no one that really stands out to me as that guy. I mean, Montez Sweat, maybe. I'm not the biggest fan of Sweat, but I know some people like him. Um, think he has the versatility to play standing up. I don't see that with him. And then um, Tr- uh, Chase Winovich, he, he, he's strictly hand-in-the-dirt guy, so I wouldn't feel comfortable with him as, as the edge setter either. I don't know if there's anyone really in this class that you can say um, is going to play outside linebacker as an edge rusher and then also be that kind of um, tone setter on the, on the edge. 
With the 19th overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Dylan Wessling, GM for the Titans, selects Montez Sweat, edge rusher, Mississippi State. I know you mentioned maybe he's not quite the best guy. I've had my reservations about him. I don't know from the little bit that I've watched him. I don't see a lot of, you know, bend from him. I don't see a lot of physicality. I mean, he's, he's got a lot of power, right? He can he's, he can smack the guy in front of him real hard. Do you think maybe, and I, I know you kind of already said no, but if, if Landry is going to be your go-get-it kind of guy, do you think Montez can kind of be that, that powerful, you know, you're not getting past me and, and run defender type of guy? I mean, I guess so. I just don't know if you, it's worth investing that kind of pick in him because you look at Sweat's game, and, and you're right, he's not very like he's not a bendy guy. He's not trying to turn the corners much. He's winning with his counters and being active. And sure, he has some pretty good hands. But um, and one thing to factor in here is you're not. You're, I'm assuming you're not rushing him hand in the dirt as as an outside linebacker. Um, so you don't have to worry about the explosiveness as much as just use your hands, set the edge. It makes sense to an extent, but I just, I just don't know the upside you're getting with him. And, and if you're taking a guy first round, you want him to put up some numbers and, and be at least a, a decent pass rusher. I don't know if um, Montez really ever develops past, maybe slightly below average pass rusher. And here's what uh, GM Dylan had to say about the pick with uh, Brian Arakpo retiring and a pass rush that was already lacking bringing in sweat will complement Harold Landry perfectly. In my opinion, he is the best edge rusher left on the board. Uh, next up, we have the Steelers on the on the board here. What do you think as far as Steelers, as far as their needs? It's kind of tough to tell. I know last week I had talked about with Antonio Brown leaving. Obviously, they still have Juju Smith-Schuster, but you've got Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell that aren't going to be on the team. That's a lot of firepower. I had kind of focused a little bit. Gene H. in the comment section, I said I could not care any less about A.B. and Bell. They need cornerback or linebacker. Do you, do you agree that we just need to focus on defense? And then if I could pigeonhole you on that, give me a cornerback and or a linebacker to pick in this spot. Oh, I'm immediately going cornerback or linebacker. You just invested a second rounder in, uh, in James Washington out of Oklahoma State last year. You've got James Conner, who is a solid starter. All you need is like a rotational back. So I'm looking at corner, maybe safety. Um, I heard Morgan Burnett was not too good for them. So if I'm going corner here with Byron Murphy and uh, and Greedy off the board, man, that's a really tough one because there's no one else that really stands out that is worth that kind of early pick. I know DeAndre Baker has some fans. Um, the Georgia corner, Amani or Warrie from Penn State has some fans, but I don't know if I feel comfortable investing that early in either. I think maybe go safety and get Deontay Thompson out of Bama. Fair enough. First of all, don't ever say bad things about Morgan Burnett. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> With the 20th <laughs> overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Dan Kelp, GM for the Steelers, selects Devin Bush, linebacker, Michigan. So I know you mentioned him briefly early on. You said he wasn't going to be worth a top 10 pick. We're getting toward the end of the first. Do you think maybe Devin Bush isn't the worst pick here? This is where I started thinking it's a lot, it's a, it's a lot better pick because um, maybe not as high upside as someone like Devin White, but I think he's a lot more refined and, and ready to step in day one in terms of how he processes things and just gets after it. Um, a lot better decision maker than Mac Wilson. Maybe not the same type of athlete, but I think you can put him in immediately starting on the inside for the Steelers and in He's, he's a Steelers pick. I mean, just a get downhill, play tough kind of linebacker um, with enough athleticism to hold up in coverage. So I really like the pick. So next up, we got the Seattle Seahawks. And I personally am really struggling with this because I've been, you know, on one hand, obviously everybody wants offensive line. On the other hand, I look at it and I say, this defense is deteriorating. We got to do something about it. And then on the third hand, you're looking at it and saying, well, we got to start feeding your quarterback some help because it's just that this team is just eroding everywhere. It instinctually... Are you looking offense or defense? Just forget the board. What's your first instinct right now? You know, my first instinct is jumping into the mindset of what are the Seahawks going to do? And the Seahawks are the type of team, they don't care what you think. They don't care about the board like the the media has or what people expect. They have a very, very funky – you saw it. They took Rashad Penny first, yeah. uh, first down last year. Yeah. First thing that jumps out at me is Rashawn Gary is available – do they love the athleticism? Or are they going to go chase after him? That's what I think straight out the gate. But, yeah, looking at their offensive line, that's probably the biggest need. They've struggled with it for quite a while now and haven't been able to consistently put out a line um, that is, I wouldn't say NFL caliber because they're obviously playing in the NFL, but not up to expectations and really has filled Russell Wilson. I think Chris Lindstrom, I know I've been raving about him, but him and Dalton Risner, one of those guys got to go. I know it's not the sexiest pick, 
It's not the pick that, you know, stands out and everyone gets hyped over. But those are two maulers and guys that have, you know, Lindstrom doesn't have the versatility, but Risner does. you got to get some help on the interior. Just one more thing, and I'm doing my absolute best to not insult fan bases. I know people get upset when I say this, but I do not like the job they've done drafting recently. In general, I don't like it. If I had to get you to give me, yeah, if I had to get one name, just give me a safe guy. Like, just just give me somebody that's probably not going to bust. I don't want high upside. Give me safe. A safe guy. You know, Earl Thomas, maybe maybe I'm wrong on this. I think Earl Thomas is probably on the way out. Cam Chancellor has gone. Go get Taylor Rapp. Taylor Rapp's not, you know, a, flat, a flashy guy by any means. He's not a phenomenal athlete. But at safety, you get a, a big hitting guy who consistently wraps up and brings people down, reads the, reads the play so fast and gets in there. I mean, he is a very instinctual and a very intelligent player. And Taylor Rapp, I think, is one of the – I would say he's the safest uh, safety in, in the class. So I would say go get Taylor Rapp and, and get a surefire, I, w- I would say, above average starter, if not pro bowler. With the 21st pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Kyle Zahn and the Seattle Seahawks select Deontay Thompson, safety out of Alabama. So you're pretty close. They're they're thinking along those same lines, getting that Earl Thomas replacement. Now I'm I'm really curious about this because Deontay was borderline top five, a lock top ten. Then he was you know moving back and back and back. Now you're starting to see out of the first round. What's going on with Deontay Thompson? Why does he keep dropping like this? And what are your thoughts on him overall? Like I mentioned earlier, he just he came on real strong early on in the season and then kind of faded out as we got closer to the college football playoffs, struggled um, throughout those two games and, and didn't really live up to the expectations that people had on him. And, um, you know, he, he wasn't finishing when he had opportunities to, to make, uh, force turnovers. When the ball hit him in the hands, he, he wouldn't be able to reel it in. And I have heard people question his size. Um, and just his his instinctiveness. I think, like I said, Rapp's a safer pick, but Thompson's probably going to blow up the combine. I expect him to run in the four threes, maybe high four threes, but he should still run in the four threes. Um, I think after his testing and people see the type of athlete he is, he's going to kind of rise back up the board a little bit. So the Baltimore Ravens are next up on our list here. Uh, another team that invested in quarterback last year. Obviously, Lamar didn't have as good of a year as a lot of people would have thought. What were your thoughts on him coming out of college last year, and, and what do you think about him as being the franchise quarterback for the Ravens going forward? I think he's definitely the franchise guy, and I think Lamar in the pros is the same Lamar we saw in college. Um, concerning mechanics in terms of his lower body setup, kind of real narrow base, and that threw off his accuracy. Accuracy has always been the big issue with him. Very solid athlete. I would say, you know, even more than that, obviously, a, a very impressive athlete um, who can make plays with his legs and, and did that quite a bit. Probably can't run as much as he did in his rookie season moving forward just to protect his body. But, you know, I, I use the word dynamic with Kyler Marina. I'd use it with Lamar as well of just it's very tough to defend against him. I think he's certainly worthy of being considered their franchise quarterback. So in this particular spot, if you're the Ravens GM, what what's jumping out at you right now? You know, they've done a very good job of putting together a team that doesn't have many holes. You look at that defense, and, and there's really no one that stands out as, like, a massive concern. I guess running back, you could you could make an argument. Gus Edwards um, has been decent for them. Alex Collins has been decent. But um, neither guy is a standout guy that you really want to say, okay, that's a, a top-of-the-line back. I guess... I guess the first thing I would think is Josh Jacobs, the Alabama connection with the Ravens has always been very strong. And Jacobs is probably running back one, um, not only for them, but for the majority of the teams in the league. I think Josh Jacobs would make sense here. I think maybe you could call it a luxury pick, but I don't know if there's anything else that demands attention. I guess you could say receiver, which DK is still available as well. So those are the two guys I'd say, Josh Jacobs and DK Metcalf. With a 22nd overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Derek, GM for the Ravens, selects Hakeem Butler, wide receiver, Iowa State. So they are getting a weapon for uh, their quarterback. Obviously not your top guy who seems to be dropping in this particular mock, but what do you think about Hakeem Butler? Well, first I want to say this is what's so fun about it is I've been raving about DK Metcalf, and we now have seen two guys go over him, and I'm not even saying that it's bad. I think it's fun to see, and Hakeem Butler has – some of the best upside in the entire class. I mean, 6'5", he can get up over anyone to go catch the football. He's physical as a blocker. He mows people over. He's a very aggressive guy. I just don't know if 
I have I have questions about the athleticism. Combine is going to be huge for him because I think he could run in the four sixes, which would hurt his stock quite a bit. I think you compare him to something like Nikhil Harry, for instance, and a little bit more stiff, a little bit more straight line, but he's so much more physical and just a dominating presence. You know, Lamar's got to have with Lamar's accuracy concerns, you got to have a guy who has the um, the size to go up and get it wherever Lamar puts it. Hakeem Butler can do that. And that, it, like you said, with the wide receivers, especially with this group, with, with the, the kind of traits that they have, you can definitely see something like this happening where you, it's going to be hard to predict because you're going to have some teams that just fall in love with certain guys and their specific attributes that they bring. So it's really going to be hard to decide who goes where and when. But, yeah, it, Hakeem Butler, obviously another traits guy, really big guy. Uh, next up, we've got the Jets on the docket with the 23rd pick. Back on the board once again. We've talked about them several times now. But at this particular point in time, Jets are here. What sticks out to you? you got to go get the lineman now. You've waited and you've waited. And, and you've seen Greg Little go. You've seen um, a lot of these guys go off the board now. And you, you've got to go and get a, get a lineman. Get somebody. You missed uh, the opportunity to get Cody Ford. I mean, just please get, I mean, whether it's Risner or um, Lindstrom or whoever, maybe you – Really want to really want to get risky and take some, let's say Andre Dillard from from Washington State. Whoever it is, please just get get some help <laughs> or Sam Darnold and protect him. And if if I told you specifically our number one goal for an offensive lineman, I don't want anyone to touch our quarterback. Pass protection. Who's the number one guy that's going to jump out of the guys that are left? Oh, that's tough because Risner is probably specifically a right tackle. Yanni Kajou stands out a lot to me because very active hands. Great athlete as well, and you could probably have him be more effective in the run game. But, um, you know, I think just going, if we're only concerned about protecting Darnold, it's between Dillard and, and, and uh, Yadne Kajust from uh, West Virginia. With the 23rd overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Gary and the New York Jets select Kelvin Harmon, wide receiver, NCST. So another wide receiver off the board. Similar train of thought as far as helping the quarterback. Um, I think the obvious potential question mark here is how effective is this going to be if, if you don't have an offensive line but um yeah what, what do you think about the pick and your thoughts on kelvin Harmon? Well, one thing i want to throw out there is i think the fact it's a facebook group these guys aren't caring about the offensive line as much because we've seen a couple <laughs> but we haven't seen the, the interior guys the the hog no, you, you're gonna get the flashy stuff man you're getting pass <laughs> rushers and wide receivers yeah which i'm surprised metcalf keeps falling but anyways kelvin Harmon, in the same vein as, as hakeem butler i think he's he's a little bit more athletic than butler is but they're pretty much the exact same type of receiver jump ball guy Harmon, i think gets up a little bit better um in terms of actually getting up getting air time and climbing the ladder maybe not as physical after the catch but again just a better athlete overall than, than hakeem butler but um he has wide receiver one upside. I don't know if I would trust him to immediately fill that role, but at it, it, the very worst, he's going to be a great jump ball guy for Darnold to put it up to. So next up, we got the Browns back on the clock, and as I said with that trade, they now have both of the Raiders' picks. So now looking at the Browns' situation, we already talked about them a little bit, but you've got two picks coming up, so you can be a little bit strategic here as far as what you're trying to do. What is your thought overall as far as how you want to attack this first round and which player sticks out to you or position group, however you want to go about it, kind of stands out as a good pick right here? Corner stands out to me immediately because after Denzel Ward, they have Travis Carey and EJ Gaines from what I'm gathering. And then wide receiver stands out as well because after Jarvis Landry and Antonio Callaway, it's Rashad Perryman, uh, Rashard Higgins. I would say there's a couple of corners that you're going to have the opportunity to uh, to take um, in the next couple of picks when you get to pick again with the other Raiders pick. But right now I'm saying you got to go and get uh, another receiver. Um, give Baker another guy to throw it up to. I'm going to really refrain from saying Metcalf here. <laughs> because I'm stunned he's fallen this far, but I'm going to say you want a speedster, um, you know, maybe get maybe get some kind of filled the same role as Perryman did, but um, a lot more uh, complete overall and, like, um, just a better athlete, I guess, um, compared to where Perryman is now post-injury. I would say maybe Marquise Brown from Oklahoma makes sense. Uh, reunite Baker with him. I, I really like that as, as an option here. With the 24th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Luke Fisher, GM for the Cleveland Browns, selects DeAndre Baker, cornerback out of Georgia. So you mentioned cornerback, obviously one of the better ones uh, in your opinion. The other good thing that I particularly like about this is not only is it kind of a need, 
but now it goes from kind of a need to a pretty big strength with Denzel Ward and now DeAndre Baker. What are your thoughts on the pick and DeAndre Baker overall? It's a, it's a good pick. I don't think Baker is necessarily a high upside guy, but he's a very solid starting cornerback. Um, the athletic testing is something that's going to be really important because I've seen people that are all, all of the board on him. I've, some, I've seen some people saying he's going to run the 4-4s. Four I've seen some people saying he's going to run closer to 4-6. I think that's really going to – is what's going to determine his actual draft stock. But um, the tape is, is worth trusting. I think he's – smooth you can get it going in both man and zone i like the pick i think it certainly fills the need better than most of these other options at corner right now i, I want to kind of take a minute philadelphia eagles are on the clock here but just kind of reassess and i don't know if you have an official big board or not but who are some of the guys obviously your wide receivers still sitting there who are some of the guys you're looking at saying what in the world are they still doing on this board right now may i look through real quick and just yeah kind yeah of yeah take go position ahead. by position through well, Drew Locke, um, I'm really stunned that he isn't gone yet because Drew Locke has been a consensus top 10 pick for a while now. Daniel Jones, I know he's tended to fall um, in most mocks lately, but I think he's certainly worth that um, lower pick. Josh Jacobs, I've seen him, again, as early as five. So um, I know running back isn't a highly valued position, but um, the fact he's still available um, surprises me a little bit. Metcalf, of course. Um, tight end TJ Hawkinson is still on the board. Um, Noah Fan, I, 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 I'm not surprised to see Noah Fan fall this far, but um, Hawkinson for sure because I've seen Hawkinson consistently in the top 15. On the interior, no one's really surprised me. Um, I think Kajus, Risner, uh, Dillard, all late first round guys, so we may see them come off. Lindstrom probably a late first as well. Um, nobody at center really that stands out to me. Dexter Lawrence. I figured he might have some fans. He might be potentially a top 25 guy, but I'm not surprised considering he's probably strictly a nose at the next level. I think he might come off here in the next couple picks. Uh, Rashawn Gary, for sure. Rashawn Gary is, is a one that really stuns me because he's going to destroy the combine. I think some team's going to fall in love with his athleticism and reach. Brian Burns still being available is a little bit surprising. I feel like Chase Winovich, um, I mentioned him earlier, I don't think he's going to go in the top 25, but I think he's a really interesting name to watch because the team could fall in love with how refined he is and how complete he is as a player. Maybe not the greatest athlete, but they could fall in love. Mac Wilson, um, all athlete right now, you know, hasn't put his game together at all. Makes a lot of mental mistakes, but I, I've seen him, you know, with Devin White. If Devin White goes like 6'7", um, I've seen that in a lot of mocks. Uh, Mac Wilson I saw a lot, a lot more consistently to the Bengals in the top 15, in the top 20 at least. Uh, to see him available is a little bit surprising. A corner, nobody really is a huge surprise to me. Um, Baker would kind of fall into that category, but him going, um, you know, this past pick uh, takes that off the board. I guess Amani Warawari, maybe, but uh, no one huge there. And at safety, we've we've got Deontay Thompson. We've got um, we've got Adderley. I guess you could see Gardner Johnson from Florida as maybe a sleeper here. Um, I mentioned Rap earlier for the Seahawks. Um, he'd be a really good first-round pick who's just a reliable guy. But overall, if I'm just picking, like, let's say one guy, you know, one or two guys, I'd say Lock and Metcalf. I think those are almost guaranteed top 15 picks. So I'm surprised to see them both available. That's fair, yeah. And uh, with, with Wentz being on this team, I would assume uh, if you had to pick one of those two for the Eagles, we're looking at probably Metcalf would be my guess, correct? Yeah. With the, let me get back to the right screen here. With the 25th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, <laughs> Kino Nochil, the GM for the Eagles, selects Marquise Hollywood Brown, wide receiver, Oklahoma. So this is kind of the, I've talked about quite a few guys that have been falling, falling, falling. Hollywood Brown, I remember there was a lot of hype early on when I was doing mock drafts. He was mid-second round, and everyone's saying, why isn't Hollywood Brown on here? It's like, dude, I'm just following my board. I don't know. He's starting to fly up, and now we're hearing conversations, some as, as high as you know top 10 worthy. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on his skill set? Obviously, very, very talented guy, but overall, what are your thoughts on him? Everyone wants the next Tyreek Hill, and I think – you look at this class, and he's probably the closest thing to it. The the deep speed is just insane. He's probably going to run in the mid four twos. Um, if anyone's going to push John Ross's record, it's going to be him. I don't, I don't think he's going to break it, but he's going to be pretty close to it. Um, and then you look at what he does for the Eagles. They have Mike Wallace, but they do need a, a legit speed threat. 
um, to just air it out downfield to. And I think Brown fits that. Maybe a little bit of a luxury pick, but it's not a bad pick. And I think Marquise Brown, like you said, he's kind of been climbing up a little bit. And I'm really not sure where to value his draft stock because – I know some people are talking about him. I think Dane Brugler mentioned him as a potential top 10 guy, saying teams are falling in love with his game. And then I've seen other people talking about, oh, maybe he's going to fall to the third round just because of the depth of the class at receiver. I'll say speed kills. Um, obviously, the measurables, you know, how how um, how heavy he weighs in is going to be a big deal. But speed kills. If he runs a 4-2-5, he's probably going top 25. So with the Colts now next up on the uh, clock here, I, I got to say I'm completely shocked because on one hand you got a team that played like you know a Super Bowl caliber team, but as I'm looking through their roster, how in the world did they do that? I mean I, I don't even know half of these guys on their team. You know obviously uh, Leonard at linebacker is awesome, but you look at the other linebackers, they're not that good. Their safeties are okay. You take away T. Y. Hilton from the wide receiver group, okay. I mean it's just I don't want to denigrate the team too much because they are talented, but just I just feel like there's a gap between how good they played and the the talent on their roster. Obviously, it could go the opposite way. You look at, for example, the Falcons, I think, underperformed. I think the Packers underperformed. But in other words, what I'm getting at is as much as they seem like a a well-rounded team, I think they do have a couple holes that could be filled, a couple places that could be upgraded. When you're looking at this team, what what are some of the needs that you want to kind of fix and to help this team and maybe what's a good fit here? Well, you mentioned beyond T.Y. There's not too much that you, you have beyond him. Um, I think Riley Ridley kind of comes into the conversation now um, from Georgia. I know he wasn't the most productive guy there, but um, solid athlete, and I think his game's well-rounded. A.J. Brown from uh, Mississippi makes sense. And then looking, like you said, at the linebackers, you've got uh, you've got Darius Leonard, and that's pretty much it. There's a lot of huge holes that you've really got to try to mask. I, there's so much I'm kind of nervous to say, oh, I want to go after this position in particular because – You've got a lot of picks you've got to make to, to plug in for potential starters. One that I found kind of interesting is I've seen Danico Autry get uh, get talked about as maybe a potential replacement guy. So if you're looking at the D-line, maybe looking at someone that you can replace there. Maybe go after Jerry Tillery, Charles Omenayu, um, you know, one of those more athletic guys, and put him in as a replacement for Danico Autry. With the 26th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Drayton Davis selects for the Indianapolis Colts. Jeffrey Simmons, defensive tackle, Mississippi State. So right out of the gate, for me personally, and again, this is more your lane than my lane, I love Jeffrey Simmons as a player. I I think he's just an absolutely dominant guy. Obviously, there's some off-the-field concerns. Like you, I don't want to comment too much. I'm usually pretty vocal if it's something out of control, but it sounds like there's maybe some gray area here, but... Um, as a player in general, what do you think about Jeffrey Simmons and then the fit in particular? I just want to say I completely forgot about him even being available yeah. here. I <laughs> skimmed over him when I went position by position. I know I mentioned him earlier because his his talent level was top 15, but you got to you got to be concerned about the red flags. And like you said, uh, I think there's a little bit of gray area with this. I don't think it's it's a glaring concern as long as he you know interviews well with teams and and uh, doesn't have any other issues. But I think it's it's certainly a steal talent-wise, and he can come in and immediately be a, a very quality, well-rounded defensive tackle for them. And just I, I do want to touch on it a little bit just to give my understanding of what the situation is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me that this is something that happened a long time ago. This was, I believe, in high school. Uh, there was a fight. Somebody was kind of beating on his sister, and he intervened and you know maybe did some things he took took it a little bit too far but from what i've heard from his teammates from his coaches he's been an absolute model citizen interviewing very very well take that for what you want if if that's a black mark on your on your whatever you don't want to touch him that's fine but just just to give some insights um like i said i I don't personally tolerate that there's certain guys like francois i have no problem saying he doesn't belong anywhere in the nfl but um i I think simmons it's it's worth considering that that perhaps this is something that uh, he's learned from and from everything i've heard he's he seems to be a very very good guy and a very good teammate so just if you you don't mind i'll add to that as well just you know there is some gray area with it you've got to consider you know what you value as a team and and how you think of these guys i kind of go on a on a situation of severity versus repetitiveness you look at the situation i mean i think he was 18 or 19 at the time um, his sister was getting beat up by by another uh, by another girl, and he stepped in, um, threw a punch, and you know it, it wasn't a good situation at all. But it wasn't something that I think was severe as like a Francois situation 
or a situation where it's, you know, an actual assault or it, it wasn't even domestic violence. It was someone that he didn't know. So um, I think the fact that he's been pretty much a model citizen since then, from my understanding, I think that certainly helps his case. Absolutely. So we've got the Browns now back on the clock again. They've gotten both of those picks. So with the last pick, they went out and got DeAndre Baker. So they've got that taken care of. So now with our second pick, and I know you kind of already touched on it, but maybe throw out one or two names here that kind of makes sense for the Cleveland Browns to kind of solidify this first round. You know, looking at their their defensive line, they've got Ogunjobi fills one spot um, in D-tackle, but they still need another D-tackle. I really like Jerry Tillery towards the back of the first round. I think he's been kind of falling just because I know there's some questions about his character, his work ethic that have appeared. Um, but I think he'd be a very good option here just because he brings some pass rushing upside. Dexter Lawrence as well. Ogan Joby is your, your you know, solidified get out, get out for the quarterback type of guy. Put in Lawrence and just have him as the run stuffer. I think that would really fill out this defensive line. And it, you're telling me you can have Garrett, Ogan Joby, Lawrence, and Emmanuel Ogba on the same line? That's a nasty group of guys. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. But Luke Fisher with the 27th pick GM for the Cleveland Browns selects Rashawn Gary, defensive lineman, Michigan. So obviously we're going with defensive lineman because there's a lot of debate about where exactly he best plays. But it, for me personally, it does make a little bit of sense, similar to what you said, wanting to look at that. You, you've got a guy that can play on the inside, which is a bigger need. But I think somebody that uh, situationally can go opposite of, of Garrett could also make a lot of sense. So obviously somebody that you think is a good value, but as far as a, a good pick and as a player overall, what do you think of him? Yeah, I'm mixed because I know a lot of people talk about Gary like, oh, you definitely got to play him on the inside. I liked his tape against Notre Dame. It's the only game I've watched of him so far this year. But watching him on the edge, not a bendy guy, but he does move very well for a guy who's like 280 and runs like a 4'6". I mean, remarkable athleticism. And I think his uh, hand usage, while it isn't complete yet, he hasn't put everything together. I think he can play on the edge if you need him to. Um my question is just how are you going to use him and how are you going to maximize his versatility? So next up, we've got the Chargers. So looking at the Chargers situation, obviously, I'll just be honest, I get frustrated with the Chargers because they are one of the teams that you look at and you go, man, this this roster is pretty stacked. They've got talent everywhere. But they just can't put it together. <laughs> what is what is the problem? And, and so obviously your thoughts on the Chargers, but then, okay, enough is enough. This is the year. Who are we going to go get that's going to try to help us get over the edge, get over that hump so that we can actually make a push in the postseason for once? Oh, man, you're so right. You look at that roster, and they've got a good line. They've got some playmakers, a receiver, Melvin Gordon solid. Phil Rivers is a franchise quarterback, of course. Hunter Henry being healthy uh, this upcoming year is going to be useful. And then defensive line, you've got Joey Bosa, uh, Melvin Ingram. You've got so much talent on this defense and offense. Um, it makes it tough to say, okay, well, where's the one spot we need to, to go after? Um, I think Brandon Meebane getting up there in age, not being as, as effective. You need a legit nose tackle. I think Dexter Lawrence does fit that bill. So I wanted to at least get a little bit of Chargers talk because, unfortunately, they're not going to get a, a, a pick in the first round. The Dolphins are going to trade up from the second round into the first round. They're giving up their second, third, and a sixth to move up. And just for the record, I didn't mention this, the – the mock draft did go into the second round. We're not doing that today, but there is going to be a second round, so eventually we'll get to the Chargers pick. As of right now, so we got the Dolphins. Obviously, the, the GM here, who do we have for the, the Dolphins? David, pretty aggressive, right? He moved all the way up to number one overall. Now he's moving back up into the first. For me personally, the Dolphins, with all the needs that they have, I'm more of a trade-down kind of person. Let's get a bunch of picks and, and maybe work on getting a quarterback. But David's not messing around, so... What what are you thinking? This is we're, we're getting aggressive. Obviously, we got Nick Bosa, who's going to be the, the the franchise defensive guy. Who are we getting right now for the Dolphins? What what is so important we have to go up and get? Well, you got your franchise defensive cornerstone and Nick Bosa. Now you got to get a franchise offensive guy, and you're moving back into the first round. Get that get that uh, fifth year option. Go get a quarterback. Go get Drew Locke or Daniel Jones. It makes the most sense. Um, you know, even if you keep Tannehill around for another year, so you can. Bring these guys in and try to develop them and give them a year to sit. I think Jones can come in and start immediately. Maybe Locke needs a year to sit. But either way, I think you got to go in and get a quarterback. With the 28th overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, David and the Miami Dolphins select Drew Locke, quarterback, Missouri. So obviously 
as much as I maybe don't agree with the philosophy overall, there's no question this team is, is heads and tails better than they were last year. you got Drew Locke as your quarterback and Nick Bosa on defense. So what, overall, what do you think about Drew Locke and his game? I know you said maybe City year, but what, what are some of his strengths and weaknesses that you saw? Looking at the, the strengths first, the fact that he has one of the best arms in the classes immediately stands out. He can make every throw. Um, his athleticism is a plus. He can get outside of the pocket and scramble. I thought he improved significantly heading into his senior year. If he had come out last year, he'd be probably a fourth, fifth round pick um, just because he, he wasn't a polished decision maker, made mistakes with the football and, and just put it where it shouldn't go. This year, he was a lot better, didn't stare down his first read, could occasionally find the check down. I think he still has a, a ways to go. His footwork is a question at times because it throws off his mechanics. But Drew Locke has, I, I would say he can come in and be a, maybe a, a average starter in his first year, develop into an average starter over time. Um, he's he's a, I wouldn't say a project because I do think he has startability uh, straight out of the gate if you really want to push him for it. But um, he's still developing. He still needs a little bit of time. So next up, we got the Chiefs, and um, sort sort of hard to read. On one hand, you look at it and say fantastic team, but on the other hand, you look at it and say this defense is just, I don't know if it's going to be enough to, to officially get them over the hump. If you look at what they've got, maybe you can say that they've got some really good outside linebackers, but Houston's getting up in age. Ford isn't a guarantee to be back, and even if he is, he had one good year, and the rest not was a little bit suspect. Safeties, linebackers, pretty much anywhere you could make a case for something. What are you kind of looking at right here as the Chiefs? If, if you're saying, okay, obviously we're Super Bowl caliber, but we, we need to make some adjustments, what's the biggest thing you can do right now to help this team to, to make a big leap? Well, I looked at cornerback, and, and Kendall Fuller and Steven Nelson, if they do decide to bring Steven Nelson back, I'm pretty sure he's a, a soon-to-be free agent. Um, you know, that, that that's a concerning area. But Eric Berry, and then, I mean, maybe I'm wrong on this, but the only other safety I'm seeing here, the other safety that's listed as starter is Jordan Lucas. And uh, I haven't heard of Jordan Lucas, so that's probably not a good sign for how good he is. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong and he's actually a beast and I'm not up to date, but I think I've seen consistently people saying you got to go get a safety. Mentioned Taylor Rapp earlier. Now's the time. Go get him. Um, you've got Barry, who's already you know a stud on the back end, and then you bring in Rapp, who um, just kind of cements that and, and really – Maybe not the, the same level of upside that you get with someone like Chauncey Gardner-Johnson or, or had you taken Deontay Thompson, you know, moved up to get someone like him earlier. But um, Taylor Rapp is just a very reliable tackle, like I mentioned. And you can plug him in, and he's a day one starter and a day one um, very quality player, I guess. With the 29th pick in the 2019 NFL's draft, Zach Ayers, GM for the Chiefs, selects Julian Love, cornerback, Notre Dame. So he went defense. We can say that much. I, you know, to be honest, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about Julian Love, which maybe doesn't bode too well for the pick. But it is kind of nice to get a new name in the first round. So, what, what do you think overall about uh, Julian Love out of Notre Dame? Obviously, you guys can't see it. I'm grinning ear to ear. I love <laughs> Julian Love, and, and I didn't mention him with other, these other corners because I haven't seen anyone talking about Julian Love as a first round guy. I think he can easily get in there. I think uh, when you look at his skill set compared to like Orwari, like I mentioned, some of these other guys. Um, he's a lot more complete, very reliable in man coverage. He sticks to guys like glue, good frame, well put together. I think just – I wouldn't say the complete package because I don't think he's the same type of athlete that you're getting with someone like Byron Murphy or uh, or Greedy Williams. But um, I think he's a very, very solid day one starter who can match up with most wide receiver ones in the league and hold his own. Yeah, that's and, that, and that's pretty exciting too. You know, you, you get – like we talked about, people have their own preferences, but this is a different situation where we're not just talking about you know early first round or which of the first round guys do you like. But there's sometimes when it's you know there, there's guys you know for me it's uh, I, I'm gonna forget his name, but the defensive tackle that's basically a third round guy. I love that guy. Occasionally there's just guys you watch and it's like I don't know why nobody likes him, but I'm taking him. I don't even care. So yeah, it's pretty cool that you get to see guys like Julian Love out of Notre Dame. And now the first thing I want to do. And everybody listening to this probably is going to want to do is say, I need to go check out this Julian Love guy because I've never even seen him before. So, by the way, head over to NFLBigBoard.com. You know, you can go check him out over there. But um, Hold on. Let me let me throw the plug in. Yep. What's on DraftNFL.com? You can check out the database. All the cut-ups for Julian Love are available on there. And he has six games you can watch. Um, you can watch the game that I took most of my analysis from in uh, Michigan 2018, Stanford 2018 as well. Go check him out. Um, I think you will be pleasantly surprised by Julian Love. Yeah, that's right. He's He's got on his site also, um, on top of the breakdowns, he, he has, you know, specifically as opposed to what I have, which is 
basically just a search in, in YouTube. He's got specifically the games, so you can click directly on each of those games in the year and all that kind of stuff. So, as I said, another really good resource. Mine's a little better, but no, his is awesome. No, I'm not just they're, they're very different and they're complementary, right? Mine is just sort of, it pulls all the information into one place, but if you're looking for, for specific breakdowns and that kind of stuff, um, go take a, check out Mark's site. As long as you have those two side by side, it's, it's, there's literally nothing you're not getting as far as information. So the Green Bay Packers are finally back on the clock. I've been waiting all this time, sitting there twiddling my thumbs, watching to see these guys fall. There's a few guys that I like that are still left on the board, but right now with the 30th pick, we got a defensive tackle, some question about whether that was good or not. What what are you thinking right now? The Green Bay Packers have a lot of needs. Who's the guy that needs to go here? Well, you already invested in Ed Oliver here. Um, You know, I I kind of like Brian Burns, even though he might be better suited building up his frame and playing hand of the dirt. I'm going to say TJ Hawkinson. The fact T.J. Hawkinson is still available, and you, and you probably need some help at tight end. I know they have Jimmy Graham, but he hasn't lived up to expectations, um, from my understanding, of the Packers. So I would say go get T.J. Hawkinson and get a get a star tight end. It's funny you say that because, as I said, I'm, I'm on Packers Twitter quite a bit. There is nobody talked about more right now than T.J. Hawkinson, and I'm talking at number 12. People want him gone at 12 to go get him. So yeah, at this point, even though I mean it'll it'll be a it'll be a match because they haven't taken an edge rusher yet. But at this point, you've got probably two guys that everybody wants, and that's either Brian Burns or T.J. Hawkinson going here. So with the 30th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Jai V and the Green Bay Packers select Brian Burns, edge rusher, Florida State. So I'll be honest, this is one of the guys I started. Just, you know, thumping my chest over. This is before I realized how small he was, but I just remember watching him, and nobody was talking about him. You know, you heard about Polite. You heard about Allen. You heard about all these other guys, and I'm like, dude, Burns is awesome. I mean, you, you know, obviously you take those concerns and everything else, but as a as a pass rusher, he is so fast. And, and you know, there are some times where they snap the ball, and he's just he's behind the line of scrimmage. I don't even know how he got there. So I really like Brian Burns, but yeah, what what are your thoughts on him, especially in the uh, three four system? Well, you know how they've been uh, keeping track of his weight pretty well, and uh, I've seen he's listed closer to around two fifty right now, which is really? a very good sign. And, and you watch his tape, and he looks a lot bigger than you. You see the two thirty measurement watching his tape, you're like, how is this guy two thirty? Exactly. He's, he's got the wide hips. I mean, he's he's got the frame for it um, to add a lot of weight. And like you said, he's a very Solid pass rusher overall. I mean, he has the counters. He has the band. He can do it all. The biggest question for him has just been the weight. And I think if um, if he gets up to 255 and tests like we expect him to with the combat and everything, getting him this late would be an absolute steal because I think he could pu- push himself in a top 10 talk uh, with a good combine showing. So pick number 30, right? That's, that's a steal. A it's, steal and a half. It's funny you said that, too, because, like I said, I watched him before I saw the weight thing, and I remember thinking, I like Josh Allen, but Brian Burns is like a bigger, stronger, you know, kind of Josh Allen type. And then I saw the weight, and I was like, you got to be kidding me, because he just looks. I mean, you and you watch him. He sets an edge. It's it's incredible to me, because I watch him, and it's like he's too small. He's not, though. He can take that on. You know, there's other guys that look bigger and get washed out, and maybe you get him in the NFL, and he'll kind of get smacked around a little bit. It's just college, but... I, I was shocked to find out his his weight because I, I yeah and, I and he like looks he too, like he's, like you said he looks two fifty five on tape right. like he looks yeah. like a big dude he looks bigger than Josh Allen so you're like where is all this weight at I mean right. where like he's got the frame so you're just like why is he not uh, bigger on the scale but you you mentioned how does he fit into the three four and I think it's a thing worth asking because I thought he was most effective hand in the dirt getting that kind of explosiveness. Um, out of that uh, out of that stance so having him rush off the edge um, it's something I think he's going to have to rely a lot more on his hand counters I think he can get it done but I'm curious um, how exactly that af- affects um, his ability but if, if he only let's say weighs in at 245 it's still a good pick because at 245 um, that's about where you're expecting for an, an edge rusher uh, outside linebacker my question would just be how well does he move in space and can he can he drop back in coverage so next up, we've got the New England Patriots, and i got to be honest, I have as hard a time picking for the Patriots as I do for the Bears because I just don't want to do good things for these teams. <laughs> I'm just so tired of you guys winning every single Super Bowl. It's starting to drive me a little bit nuts. But we're here, and we're going to try to do our best to uh, to do what's best for the New England Patriots. Um, so what do you, what do you think? What, you know, I, I don't even know how to ask the question, what do they need? They don't need anything, but if, if you were going to try to help out the Patriots, what are you going to do for them? Oh, man, this is a really tough one. Like you said, there's nothing they really, I guess, need, need. 
I could see an argument for going linebacker and interior line. Those are the two big ones I've seen mentioned. Dexter Lawrence, I, I think you're, I mean, with already having Danny Sheldon, they're not going to want a, a big uh, nose tackle type of guy. Looking at linebacker, though, I mean, uh, Mac Wilson makes sense if you want to bet on the upside. It's still a somewhat risky pick. Maybe get a little bit wild and take like Voshan Joseph from Florida here. Um, overall, I just there's no pick that really stands out. I think the Pats would be better served moving back. Well, that's exactly what we get because the Jacksonville Jaguars are going to move up. They're going to give up a second and a third. Uh, they're going to get from the Patriots not only this pick but the Patriots. Um, I don't know a third, I guess whatever. But we got the Jaguars moving up here. Obviously, we got to try to decide what exactly they're moving up for. It kind of makes sense what they're probably looking at, but what are your thoughts? Well, you got to kill Harry. You got your wide out. Um, even though I don't like how early they went and got him. But um, you still got Daniel Jones on the board here, and you've got Blake Bortles at quarterback. Daniel Jones is a better quarterback than Blake Bortles. Pull the trigger. With the 31st pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, Michael and the Jaguars select Daniel Jones, quarterback out of Duke. I, you know, I, I don't watch a lot of quarterbacks because, you know, being a Packers fan, I try to focus my efforts on things that maybe the Packers would pick. And I'm having a hard time trying to figure out what these quarterbacks are good at because you hear such different things about these quarterbacks. Some people love this guy, hate this guy, whatever. What is it about Daniel Jones that has some people really excited, and why do some people just think he's not going to be any good in the NFL? Well, the I can see both sides of it. You look at what he does from a mental processing standpoint, how quickly he diagnoses the defense – um, you know, attacks leverage with good accuracy, um, gets his guys into space and, and gets the ball to him. And just he, he's a very pro ready quarterback in that regard. And then also you look at the mechanics. I mean, he has probably one of the cleanest uh, overall setups and throwing motions that you can find. All of his throws are, you know, base up. The fork is perfect almost every time. He just I, I don't want to say, you know, the whole stereotype. of Oh, he looks the part. Daniel Jones looks the part. Um Sneaky athletic as well, I guess you could throw in there because um, they used him a little bit as a runner at Duke. I don't think you're going to find uh, much success doing that with him as uh, as a pro, but um, he has enough. You know, if you want to get him uh, in a scramble situation, he he can get it done um, and pick up some yardage. The big thing with him is just what's his ceiling because of his arm strength? Because he has an average arm, and it's it's helped out by the fact his mechanics are so clean and everything's based up. You know, he doesn't ever try to go all arm with his throws. Natural arm talent is not a plus for him. And then you get him off platform. Let's say the pocket breaks down and he has to get outside and throw on the move. It's a mess. Like he cannot generate the arm strength in, in that situation to get it downfield um, and, and throw an effective, accurate football. The structure has to be perfect. You have to protect him very well. But if you, if you protect him well, Daniel Jones can be a, a quality starter. So obviously we've got one more pick, and I, I just I probably don't need to clarify this for most people, but some people are going to get very, very irate because they don't like when things are inaccurate. We know that the New England Patriots didn't win the Super Bowl, and they have the 32nd pick. The reason that it's like this, this mock draft started before the Super Bowl, so the order wasn't quite sure. I could have just changed it, but you know people make decisions based on trades, based on where things are, and I just made the executive decision. I'm not going to mess with it and get everybody upset. People worked hard on this mock. We're going to leave it as is. So I know people are going to get mad, but I'm sure you'll you'll get over it, and from now on they'll be the correct order. That being said now, we have the Rams sitting at 32. Uh, Rams, another really, really good football team. Obviously the Super Bowl didn't go the way that they had uh, wanted it to go. What are some areas to look at for the Rams? Obviously, again, like the Chiefs and some other teams, you've got almost everything, but what's one more piece you can look at to try to get this team over the edge? You definitely need help at linebacker. Corey Littleton is, is not going to suffice, suffice there. Um you know, uh, nothing too concerning on the rest of that defense for me. But receiver, I think, does need some help. I know they, they I know they have Cooper Cup. I know they have Brandon Cooks, Robert Woods. But um, Cup going down to injury really doomed that offense. Um, they weren't able to have, like, a big jump ball guy to go up and uh, throw it to. And, and Josh Reynolds, I know, supposed to fill that role but really hasn't done that. I think, and as a Rams fan, I'm going to be a little bit – arrogant here in my pick and just say the best option available and i've been slamming it the whole time dk metcalf gimme metcalf um has wide receiver one potential and gives golf a legit top target that he can work with well with the 32nd pick in the 2019 nfl draft ian and the rams select jonathan abram safety 
Mississippi State. So you got that same smile on your face. I didn't know if this is a good smile or a bad smile, but this is another pick similar to Julian Love where he's not a, a normal name that you hear in the first round. Obviously, this is somebody that the Rams GM really, really likes because this isn't on anybody's board. So he's sticking with uh, what he feels is the right pick. What are your thoughts on Mr. Jonathan Abram? Big hitter. I mean, very, very uh, fiery run defender who comes up and, and lays the wood on people. I understand the move here because Lamarcus Joyner is, is not very effective in run defense, and he's kind of been a liability at times because of his size. But you got Taylor Rapp available. And, I mean, if you want to go upside, I guess you could go Gardner Johnson, but I think Taylor Rapp is just a better version of Abram. Um, I think you get the same thing as Abram, but much more instinctive and much more consistent with um, finishing his tackles and, and being accurate. So um, I'm a little bit disappointed in the pick. As a Rams fan, I would have much rather seen Taylor Rapp go here. Well, that's going to be it. I know this was kind of a long one, but uh, I really, really appreciate, Mark, you, you coming out and doing this. I had a really, really good time. Hopefully we can – um, like I said, there is a second round. I haven't tried to pigeonhole him into doing that with me. If not, I'll, I'll take care of it. If he has time, I hope to get him back to, to help out with that. But, um, again, uh, be sure to get in the Facebook group and uh, check out uh, my Packernet podcast as well as NFLBigBoard.com, and I will let Mark have the final word and to pitch his stuff. And uh, otherwise, you guys really enjoy your time. Thank you so much, and we'll catch you with round two next time. Mark? I'm just very appreciative to, to be able to come on here and uh, looking forward to doing more work with you over the rest of this draft season. Obviously going to be very busy going through reports and all that, but I'll, I'll try to carve out some time to get through round two. Round two is where it's going to get real fun. We're going to have a lot more of the Julian Love, Jonathan Abram type picks, and I'm really excited to get into that and, and test my knowledge for it. But um, I mentioned earlier, you guys uh, can find me on Twitter at What's on Draft NFL. You can find my website, www.whatsondraftnfl.com. All my work's on there. It's constantly coming up. You're going to see running back reports coming, receiver reports coming, just kind of uh, knocking out reports left and right. So, You folks, enjoy your day. We'll catch you for round two.